All right, so hello and welcome. Today we're going to be reacting to the Battle of Doraleum in 1097. It's part of the First Crusade series, which is a four video parter from uh, Past Battles. I recommend you go check him out. Uh, stuff's in the description for him. Um, and this is set during the High Medieval Era, so usually like 10, 1000 to, uh, 1000 to 1300 is usually what the period is set at. Um, anyway, I know some background about the Crusades. I know some things about Jerusalem and all of such, and the military side, so this ought to be interesting. So, anyway, without further ado, let's get to it. The last years of the 11th century. Answering the Pope's call, thousands of the finest European nobles gathered near Constantinople, forming one of the biggest armies since the fall of the Roman Empire. Their ultimate goal is the holy city of Jerusalem, the cradle of Christianity, currently under Muslim rule. The unprecedented string of both glorious and brutal events committed in the name of God is about to begin. It is the year 1095. The Byzantine Empire was slowly recovering after a period of civil war and invasions from all sides. Emperor Alexius Komnenos struggled to recover the empire's former power after years of poor rule at the hands of his predecessors. Begin I just want you to take a look at how far the, Sel uh, the Seljuk Turks, I think is what they are, they call them, um, look at how far they pushed back the Byzantine Empire almost to Constantinople by 1095. That's pretty bad. Now you can see why, oh no, we're dying. Um, they still have all of, you know, Greece and everything else, but that's not as really bad because they used to own all of Turkey. They still own Cyprus. But... Beginning the period known today as the Comnenian Restoration, he dispatched a message to Pope Urban II requesting military support for his fellow Christians, hoping for help with reclaiming the lands lost to the Muslims in Anatolia and on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. Pope Urban had numerous reasons to help as he sought the possibility to warm relations between Western and Eastern Christendom after the Great Schism, and, more importantly, strengthen his unstable position as leader of the Catholic Church. He organized the Council of Clermont, attended by both laymen and ecclesiastics, during which he moved the hearts of men with an inspirational speech ending with the phrase, Deus Vult, which soon became a motto of the upcoming crusade. We get that from um and also yes the schism that did happen happened a long time before this actually um and then there's a whole thing about the iconoclast and then uh, eastern christianity or more modernly known as orthodox um they were still all cons depends who you ask back then on who was a true christian but the pope says they're the true and um the byzantines say they are true right but you know the, the distinction between orthodox and catholics is more of a modern interpretation of this and by this time it probably was Set, uh, fully set in that they are Catholics versus Orthodox. The Pope's call to reclaim the Holy Land quickly spread over Western Europe through the following months. Even though Jerusalem was taken by the Muslims almost 400 years earlier and three great religions coexisted in Levant with no major friction between them. Also, the Seljuk Turks invasion of the Byzantine Empire wasn't particularly recent news as it was 25 years since the disastrous encounter near Manzikert. But one could not underestimate the power of words. Okay, so before he goes on from there, technically, technically coexisting is true, kind of. There were raids on Christians there, they would kill butchered Christians, right? Christians had to pay taxes, Jews had to pay taxes, right? Um, I wouldn't say it was peaceful coexistence. I mean, they were existing. Um, and he was right that it was around 25 years after, um, after, even though they all, the Celtics basically own everything and took 25 years until the, uh, um, the emperor of the Byzantines asked for help from the Catholic church. And this is from the Pope specifically. And this is more of a kind of a desperate call. Cause they don't, I mean, long story short, the Pope and the emperor don't get along. <laughs> is uh, the best way to describe that with the patriarch. So, yeah, asking for help from the Pope was a low game for him to play. Like, politically, is what I will say. 
Um, I don't think they did that before, but I could be wrong. So. Used at the right time and right place. With snow melting away in early 1096, various groups of peasants, townsmen, minor knights, and even petty criminals gathered to follow the charismatic monk, Peter the Hermit. In a so-called People's Crusade, unauthorized by Pope Urban, months before the planned gathering of European nobility. I don't know how that ends, but I'm assuming because it's just some minor people led by Peter the Hermit is not going to go very well. Because remember, the aristocracy is basically the military leaders of their countries. And if they're not a part of this, probably not going to go well, but we'll see. The beginning of the march was marked with a Jewish massacre committed by crusaders in Rhineland and Central Europe. Off to a great start, just like I said. <laughs> Despite the protection provided by Christian clergy, several thousand Jews were killed. The barely prepared and organized mass of people soon entered Hungary. Though initially welcomed by King Coloman, they quickly changed his mind by plundering Hungarian cities, searching for supplies and treasuries. Coloman was determined to protect his people and domain. As a result, some regular fighting ensued. Great, so we've killed Jews and now we're burning our way through Hungary. This is our amazing start to a, to a people's crusade and we're burning Byzantines it looks like too. The ill-disciplined crusade finally reached Constantinople and unexpected Emperor Alexius quickly transferred them through the Bosphorus to Asia Minor to get rid of the problem. Exactly what I would do too. I'd be like, get the ass on the boat and I want you over there. I, I don't want you staying anywhere near me. With no strong military leadership and lacking a good plan, the crusaders dispersed over the area and began unorganized raiding of Turkish territories. They took the minor castle of Zeri Gordon, a few kilometers from Nikaya, but that was just a single and not truly noteworthy success of the People's Crusade. The end of their story is a brutal one. The Turkish Sultan, Kilic Arsalan, dealt with the invaders mercilessly. Zeri Gordon was retaken and its defenders killed. Separated groups of foraging Christians were slaughtered, while the main body of the army was led into an ambush and virtually erased by superior Turkish forces near Sivatot. Out of a total of 20,000 men who reached Asia Minor, barely a few survived. Peter the Hermit avoided the massacre and later joined the Prince's Crusade, the first components of which soon reached the city of Constantinople. Of course Peter the Hermit survived. And of course this happened. I, it's almost like you could predict this stuff. I mean, you, I basically could, because they have no leader. They're just wandering around, and yeah, they get ambushed and butchered by an actual military. Not surprising at all, at all honestly. Emperor Alexios didn't really expect such a far-reaching response. Thousands of Latin nobles heeded the Pope's call and together with retinues departed their homelands to relieve their orthodox brothers in the east and eventually take back the holy land from Muslim hands. Yeah, so the reason he probably didn't expect a, an uprising like this is because they're technically two different churches. And I they might have asked, but I definitely remember um, emperors asking for help. I don't remember if they asked the Pope specifically for help before, but they definitely asked like other Christians and they're like, yeah, no. Um, this what they made, made this one different was it was for the actual Holy Land. Um, now, of course, flash, <laughs> flashing forward, um, it's not going to be under Byzantine command. It's going to be under uh, Catholic uh, uh, Crusaders command, not Byzantine command like he was hoping for. But I could have told you that was going to happen. But, you know. Among the most famous Crusaders were Godfrey of Bouillon, Duke of Low Lorraine, and his brother Baldwin, leading the imperial contingent. Robert Curtos, Duke of Normandy, with another Robert, Count of Flanders, leading a detachment from northern France. One of the wealthiest nobles of the time, deeply religious Raymond, Count of Toulouse, accompanied by the Pope's representative, Ademir Le Puy, and last but not least, fierce Bohemond, Prince of Taranto, and his nephew Tancred, leading the Norman contingent from southern Italy. Yeah, this is a lot. This is a lot of important people. Uh, Baldwin will be very important later. Um, Baldwin the first, second, and third of Jerusalem and stuff. Um, but yeah, all these guys, they know what they're doing. It's, and they have money, and they have knights, and they have retinues. So it's going to be a little bit different when they go into um, Turkish Mi or Asia Minor. There were plenty of reasons for this unusual gathering, maybe even as many as the number of European magnates willing to participate. 
the desire of adventure, remission of sins offered by the Pope, and simple eagerness to fight the infidels were just the more popular reasons. But let's move the story forward. Alexius took advantage of the crusade leaders arriving at Constantinople one by one and forced them to pledge to return all future reclaimed lands back to the empire. I pledge to return the land to the, Const to the Byzantine Empire. Except they're doing this with their other hand. It's great. Fantastic. I love it. Just after making the vow, they were then transported via the strait to Anatolia, where the combined crusader force assembled in spring of 1097. Despite the inability to choose a single leader, they agreed to set the city of Nikaya as their first target. It was the former capital of the recently established Sultanate of Rum, a state that seceded from the Seljuk Empire which suffered a heavy decentralization of power since the death of Sultan Malik Shah five years earlier. Nikaya was a well-fortified stronghold on the eastern shore of Lake Ascanius. However, its walls were more than six kilometers long, making it quite hard to defend by the undermanned Turkish garrison. The first Christian units reached the city on the 14th of May and began preparations for the siege. Alexius aided the Crusaders with a 2,000-strong detachment under General Tatikios, together with an engineering unit and siege equipment. I'm kind of wondering why he only sent 2,000 men, because this is close enough to Constantinople where he could say that this is going to be Byzantine stuff. And maybe the Crusaders will hand it over to him because it's so close. Um, I'm surprised he didn't send more. Probably didn't have any more. He definitely had more men. I'm just surprised he didn't send any more. Maybe for expense reasons. But yeah, he's using NATO icons for infantry and cavalry. So if you don't know what those are, this is cavalry, this is infantry, and then this is also infantry with C with just you know stuff over it. Um, these are just minor infantry, more or less. Nikaya was supplied across the lake to some extent and stood strong despite lack of sufficient defense. The Crusaders surrounded the city but their initial attempts to crush the walls and storm inside failed. In the meantime, Sultan Kilic Aslan rushed back west with relief forces. After wiping out the People's Crusade, he had little respect for another Latin army gathering near Constantinople and was busy campaigning in the east. Yet as soon as he learned of how numerous the following Christian invasion was, he quickly moved the Turkish army back to defend his lands. They reached the besieged city on the 21st of May and immediately struck the Crusaders from the south. Now I just want you to take a look at how, how like, this whole time he was traveling, he was traveling from out here all the way here. Okay, that's how long sieges usually took, a significant amount of time, especially back in this day, to actually get them. That's why if you, that's why all sieges are basically, can the defender hold out long enough for a relief force? And this is a relief force, so now they can either sally out or they can sit in there, or they can just buy more time. It's up to the defender, honestly. And immediately struck the Crusaders from the south. The Sultan's forces tried to break through to the city, but the attack of his light-armored mounted units was pushed back by Raymond's well-equipped soldiers. It was surely a surprising experience for Kilic Aslan when he saw the impetus of the charge of heavy cavalrymen serving the Frankish lord. Soon, Willing to avoid further losses, the Sultan commanded a general retreat, dismaying the Nikayan garrison. Dis yeah, it's never good when you need a defender and you see a relief force get absolutely decked. You're like, your morale was a here and now it's basically in the toilet. So. Despite the failed attempt to break the siege, the city garrison kept up a rugged defense, unwilling to surrender. Then. After a few days of fruitless attempts to overwhelm the Nikayan defense, Crusaders finally decided to complete the encirclement using Byzantine help. Some ships of the Imperial fleet were pulled to the lake and... That's insane. That's actually insane. Um, Grant did something similar in the American Civil War. Um, that, that's insane. Yeah, so basically you, you basically pick up your ships and you get rolling logs and you roll the bitches all the way to a leg, and then you can use them. Uh, yeah, it's pretty ingenious. Also damn near hard and impossible but to do, but you give them credit. Soon, blocked the harbor completely. 
Upon losing the last line of supply, the defenders' morale was crippled. They surrendered the city to the Byzantine sailors during the night, yet kept the city gates closed. This was part of Emperor Alexius's plan, as for centuries, Nikaia was an important Byzantine stronghold, so he didn't let the crusaders into the city, fearing the possible plundering. Of course, the crusaders felt cheated when they saw the imperial banners waving on the walls in the morning. But Alexius cunningly quelled their discontent with money and precious gifts. That's actually very smart, what he did there, because the sailors went in, the, the Celtics surrendered to them. They didn't want to surrender to the crusaders, obviously. And then when they surrendered, he's able to flip them all, not, not open the gates, because the crusaders definitely would have fucking plundered the city, I guarantee you. Um, and it is very true that he did pay them off. Now, this probably still pissed some of them off. They're like, I thought we were over here, you know, crusading. Technically, they were supposed to give them their land, but they might have actually given them this one, how close it is, but they're definitely not going to give them any more, I don't think. With the first objective accomplished after the one-month-long siege, the uplifted crusader army departed further south in the middle of June. Due to the huge size of the marching column, the leaders made the uneasy decision to split their forces. Normans under Boyamont and Robert Curtos formed the vanguard, while the bigger part led by Raymond and Godfrey marched a day behind them. They obviously knew that such a move was risky, since the Seljuk troops were still a threat, but it was much easier to provision two smaller groups, especially on the hilly terrain the Crusaders had to pass through. That is very true. So it looks like they took one cavalry detachment in the vanguard and one infantry detachment, and they have three infantry detachments and one cavalry detachment in the second. Um, I, again, I don't know the situation that they were particularly in. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of shit you could ask. Um, but they did decide to split it into two groups. And yeah, they have no, en no idea of the enemy disposition anywhere. So it is very risky. Maybe they had some scouts on the outwings, but they, if they're a day away, I mean, the vanguard gets hit, they're all dead, and then they can crush the rest of the army. But it does make it easier to supply, and you could probably move faster like this for the vanguard. But again, it all depends on where the enemy is um, to do this. It's also a risk, but if, it pay if it's a risk, and it's risky, and it pays off, I mean, it's good, right? But if it doesn't, you can end up with Teutoburg Forest again. The Norman contingent reached a wide plain near the ancient town of Dorylaeum and set a camp there in the evening of June 30th. Boyamon and Robert received scout reports about a brief Turkish presence in the vicinity a few days earlier, but they most likely underestimated the risk and didn't even inform the rear guard. This soon turned out to be a big mistake. Yeah, that would be a big mistake. Yeah, don't even tell the rear guard. Yeah, hey, we're, <laughs> it's going great. With sunrise on the horizon, thousands of Turkish riders encircled the surprised Normans, raining arrows on their unprepared camp. Kilic Arsalan allied himself with neighboring Danishmans and struck the Crusader force once again. Boyhomong quickly organized the defense and together with all Norman mounted knights led a ferocious charge at the Turks. I'm assuming that's a runner. The one up at the top of this thing is a runner to the backside and be like, oh my God, please help, we're dying. Yet the lightly armored Muslim units easily evaded their attack, and horse archers armed with composite bows dealt significant damage while on the move. Boyhomon rode back to the camp, realizing that he couldn't defeat the enemy who presented an eastern style of warfare, exploiting hit-and-run tactics combined with outstanding mobility. Though That's true, right? So what's happening here is he's just getting fucked, obviously, but they're all cavalry, they're all mounted, and they're destroying them with arrows. Now, knights are very good, obviously, um, but they have their limitations. And one of them is chasing light cavalry down. Light cavalry go a lot faster than heavy cavalry because obviously the man in armor and the horse armor is going to slow it down. And if you can shoot and run away, I mean, and you have, you know, you have planes, this is what, which is what this is. You have planes to run around and you can just basically do what you want with the knights. Um, and they don't have to stand and fight. Yeah, this is a problem. This is looking really bad. So they're all in shield wall right now, and they're just basically probably trying to pray that the relief force gets there in time to salvage whatever's left of them. The Normans formed a solid defense with dismounted heavy armored knights on the front. Their situation was disastrous. 
Yet in spite of being overwhelmed and encircled by an enemy raining thousands of arrows on them, the Norman army endured the Turkish attack. Thanks to the heavy armor of the frontal units, the brave attitude of their commanders, and an iron discipline. Yeah, so this is very, very, very rare. I will tell you right now, this is absolutely very rare for any medieval army to do this. Um, again, they have very good armor, they're led by combatant commanders, and they are holding in a defensive perimeter, so they're not getting actually destroyed by infantry in a frontal assault right now. But still, this is very impressive for these units to actually hold on, despite everything going on. Regardless, their losses constantly increased. Five long hours had passed when the first units of the rear guard under Godfrey finally made it to the battlefield and immediately hacked their way to the besieged camp. Yet the relief force wasn't able to turn the tide of the battle either. The now close fought encounter raged for another two hours when another relief force commanded by the Pope's legate, Aruma Le Puy, and led by Byzantine guides, got around the hills and struck the Turkish camp and rear units. This was a decisive blow to the Sultan's forces. His tactical advantage rapidly diminished. Many of the Turks fled the battlefield, and the battle was essentially over. The casualties were significant as probably more than 5,000 men in total among the opposing forces had fallen that day. That's a lot of Crusaders. So their strength is around 40,000. They lost 4,000 men. That's pretty bad. Um, obviously not all the relief force was engaged, which was the rear guard. And then 10,000 men were engaged on the front side. They only had 8,000. Yeah, they will, uh, They definitely probably weren't going to win against the 10,000, maybe. But they were hurting them a lot. Surprised they didn't realize that sitting there for that long. Maybe they didn't have scouts to just see their rear guard. Probably is what happened. Um, they definitely didn't see the other flank charge either. But, um, yeah. Probably should have withdrawn a few hours earlier. Or had some scouts on the outside to let you know what the fuck's going on. But, you know. It's worth noting that both sides were surprised by the other's combat potential. The Muslim troops had shown a flexibility unknown to many Europeans, with crucial use of mounted archers, while the Crusader army made efficient use of heavy armor, endurance, and discipline under constant pressure. Kiric Arsalan learned that the Christian force was a hard nut to crack, and if he wanted to win this war, he needed to adopt a new approach to deal with this extraordinary threat. Meanwhile, after the initial successes, the Latin army treated their wounds and prepared to continue their march south to Cilicia through the hot inland of the Anatolian Plateau. All right, so that's going to be the end of the video. If you like this video, yeah, leave a like for me. Uh, my stuff's down below. Go to my Patreon if you want to support me there. Otherwise, yeah, this is a very interesting series that we are going to be continuing. Um, and Baz Battles, please go check them out. They make amazing content. Otherwise, uh, I shall see you people next time.